Greetings from St Bride's Church, Fleet Street, here in the very heart of the City of London. We're delighted that you're able to join us for this act of worship. St Bride's is famous for its ministry to journalists, and behind me here you can see our journalists' commemorative altar. We are aware as never before of the dangers that those in the industry face when bringing us the news. So our journalists and all who work in the media are very much in our thoughts and prayers at this time. However, we are, of course, here for all of you, journalists and everyone else. Do please leave us a comment or a like and tell us where you're listening from. It's always good to hear from you. And if you would like to donate to help support these services, uh, you'll find details of how to do so in the accompanying text. But now, may the light and peace of Christ be with us all as our worship begins. It is a great delight to welcome you to St Bride's to our service of choral evensong on this, the eighth Sunday after Trinity. Wherever you are in the world, and however you are listening to us, we hope that you will feel that you are very much part of the St Bride's family. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require, Wherefore, let us kneel now and humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought not to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, 
have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Old Testament lesson is written in the first book of Kings, chapter 6, beginning at the eleventh verse. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes, and execute my judgments, and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub. From the uttermost part of the one wing unto the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and one size. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it of the other cherub. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold, and he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers within and without. And the floor of the house he overlaid with gold within and without. And for the entering of the oracle he made doors of olive tree. The lintel and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. The two doors also were of olive tree, and he carved upon them carvings of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold, and spread gold upon the cherubims and upon the palm trees. So also made he for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors were of fir tree. The two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other door were folding. And he carved thereon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work. And he built the inner court with three rows of hewed stone and a row of cedar beams. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month of Ziph. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it. So was he seven years in building it. This is the word of the Lord.
The New Testament lesson is written in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out, and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. This is the word of the Lord.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. O almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe, we beseech thee, to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On Tuesday, I'm planning to visit the prison chaplaincy service at Wormwood Scrubs, which has come about after meeting an imam uh, who was at a work event that I had attended. I can't previously recall an appointment that I've looked forward to but also dreaded in such equal measure. I really don't know what to expect. The prospect feels a bit unreal. Well, the passage from the Acts of the Apostles that we've just heard tells of Peter's miraculous escape from a prison as he awaited his execution at the hands of Herod Agrippa. And the account has something of a dreamlike, filmic quality about it. We are told that Peter thought this incident to be a dream before he came to himself outside the Iron Gate and hurried to meet his brothers and sisters. Barton and, and Muddyman, in their biblical commentary, suggest that this is one of the most sensational episodes in the Book of Acts. The timing is very precise, they note. Despite his perilous and doubtless uncomfortable position, Peter is sleeping peacefully between his guards. The sudden appearance of the angel is reminiscent of Christ's nativity, and scholars suggest that the style of the writing recalls passages in ancient literature of marvellous portents or escapes. What are we to make of it? It's helpful to recognise, I think, that the Gospel's teaching about the purpose of miracles is paradoxical. In his book, The Meaning of Miracles, Geoffrey John, the former dean of St Albans Cathedral, explains this very well. At first sight, miracles seem to be intended as straightforward demonstrations of Jesus' divine power and evidence of the inbreaking of God's kingdom. At the same time, though, the Gospels contain strong warnings about the dangers of being impressed by signs and miracles. And as the story of his temptation suggests, Jesus refused to use his powers to further his own ends. There is a particular theology or understanding of the nature of divine revelation that it's helpful to recognise here, namely that faith is a gift from God and, challengingly, that God may choose to withhold that gift. Our receptivity, though, is important. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to the crowds, You people will listen and listen, but you will not understand. You will look and look, but you will not really see. He suggests that the minds of these people are closed. They have ears, but they don't listen. They have eyes, but they refuse to see. If their minds were not closed, he says, they might see with their eyes, they might hear with their ears, they might understand with their minds. Then they might turn back to me and be healed, he says. Geoffrey John suggests that there is a paradox about miracles that corresponds to the paradox of the suffering, dying Messiah. Those around Jesus must understand not only his identity as Messiah, but also the true nature of his Messiahship. Their commitment to him must not come from the attraction to power, or if it does at first, it must change to a deeper commitment, and they must ultimately be prepared to follow in the same way of sacrifice, to take up their cross and to follow him. A personal belief 
in Jesus that goes deeper than self-interest and the mere worship of power is at least part of what the gospel means by faith. And it is a lack of this kind of faith or of the potential for it that Jesus sometimes refuses to do miracles such as in his own hometown or for Herod. It is the evidence of such faith, often in the most unlikely characters, the centurion, the hemorrhaging woman, the Syrophoenician woman, the Samaritan leper, that seems to compel Jesus to perform a miracle, even when his instinct as a loyal Jew make him initially reluctant. Faith understood as openness to a relationship to God in Christ is what makes the miracle safe for the recipient and not an idolatrous wonder. John reminds us that whilst discussion of miracles is often trapped in consideration of whether they are literal accounts of actual events or not, their significance lies instead in the implications for our lives. And this points to work that each one of us needs to undertake prayerfully to reflect on the scripture. What then is this particular miracle? of Peter's release from prison, saying to us? Well, it surely indicates an understanding that the way of Christ can provide us with a release from the things that bind us. We may hear examples of this at work in our prison chaplaincy services of lives turned around. Jonathan Aitken, formerly a member of John Major's cabinet, who went to prison for perjury before later becoming an Anglican minister, speaks of his experience. I discovered, he said, as monks have discovered down the centuries, that cells are a wonderful place to pray. I was blessed by never feeling claustrophobic. It was a tiny space. The cell is, but it was a wall of space rather than just a kind of cubicle with bars. And in that privacy and in that stillness, I did feel close to God in prayer. I'd never had so much leisure that I can remember, hours and hours of time, so I structured a certain prayer discipline. I kept morning and evening and midday prayer. I slipped into it so easily. So there, it seems, his life was turned around. And we each, of course, have our own psychological prisons. Whatever they may be, Christ promises release. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Whatever it is that we find keeps us individually and collectively from the glorious liberty of the children of God, let us look to prayer for ourselves and for one another in the knowledge of Christ's promise of release. To him be all glory, now and to the ages of ages. Amen.
Let us pray. Generous God, your love sets us free and fills us with your grace. Set our hearts at peace, that we may trust in your rich bounty. Give us patient and pure hearts, O God. And we ask for your blessing on the leaders of all your holy churches. Especially we pray for Alison, our rector, for Sarah, our bishop. And today we pray in our cycle of prayer for the Anglican Church of the Central American region. We pray for the primate and bishop of El Salvador, Juan David Alvarado. We pray also for the church in Helsinki in Finland and for its bishop Timu. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, we pray for all troubled by their economic circumstances. We pray for those struggling with mortgages, with bills, with food. We give thanks for all those who provide relief, for those who work in food banks and those who support them, including the Hackney Food Bank. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, your will for us is unity. We pray for peace in the world and for all those areas where there is violence and conflict. We pray for those intent on the ways of violence that you would turn their hearts. And we ask for your blessing on the leaders of the nations. Bind us together and expand our charity to reach all your people. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, your compassion extends throughout creation. Hear our prayer for all in any kind of need. We remember, especially before you, all those in our parish community in this city and around the world. Sustain them in their troubles and restore in them hope in you. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, you are the source and goal of all life. We remember before you all those who have recently departed and those whose ears mind comes at this time. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. At the final judgment, draw us all to your treasury in heaven. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We commend ourselves and all for whom we have prayed to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers, prayers for, for the, the sake, sake of thy Son, our, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen.
The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and always. <laughs>